Hi, my name is Frank. I'm from Databricks. The founders of Databricks are the original creators of a number of popular open source projects, such as Delta Lake and Delta Sharing, two Linux Foundation projects, Apache Spark with um, Spark Streaming, uh, together like a billion downloads per year. And then we have MLflow, which is the leading MLOps framework for managing end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle. So we as a company, we created the Lakehouse paradigm and we are pioneers in data and AI. And this actually goes back to a time when AI was much less popular than today. So open source is only as good as the problems that you can solve, in my opinion. And to solve problems, you need to have customers. And we have like 10,000 customers that we're currently working with. There is quite a bit of investment from AWS and Azure and Google into Databricks. In this talk, I want to answer the question, how does AI help the modern data engineer? How does AI help the modern data engineer? I want to give you some background to the Lakehouse and data intelligence platform, where I think this is evolving into a new pattern. I want to hands-on show you, and we want to explore together modern data engineering tasks which is like obviously ingestion of batch and streaming data, it's transformation of data. We want to make sure we, we have a high data quality, also talk about orchestration of various different tasks, such as you know data pipelines, obviously, but also SQL queries, dashboards, and that also includes calling out to AI logic, which is actually possible without training LLMs for billions um, of dollars. So modern data engineering also means we need to understand the role of serverless and governance features such as data lineage. So I brought you an exciting use case. Exciting because you are challenged to use AI from a data engineer's perspective. As a data engineer, you're asked to ingest, transform data, run and orchestrate pipelines, but you also need to use Gen AI to augment the data for a small record shop. So the whole module here is about hands-on data engineering. To better understand the current problems with the classic data stack, have a look at this uh, slide. Looking at this, you understand that you have to buy a lot of different software stacks and stitch them together. There's a data warehouse where you put all your structured data. Then if you're in data science or if you're using ML platforms, you often has, have to use unstructured data, which is um, starting you know, with a cloud object store such as S3. Then there is ETL and orchestration to you know, prepare and move data orchestrate data, we have real-time systems for streaming use cases. And then, of course, there is generative AI where you want to fine-train models, you want to use your vector databases or racks. This is actually creating three problems. So the first one is enterprises are struggling, struggling with all these data silos. Each silo has a different approach to security and governance. The second one is that generative AI or AI in general is creating a lot of data privacy and control questions. And this is actually going two ways. It's going two directions. First of all is like, who is getting access to the data and, and how are you managing that for SQL tables and for S3 buckets? And don't, don't tell me you're using a flat access model to make it technically work. Second is the other direction. It's more like backwards. Like once you have a, your LLM trained, what data was the model trained on? So you need to have a way of creating some lineage that goes back from the data model through the pipeline to the volumes and data sets um, that you used. And third, there aren't enough technically skilled people that can make sense of these systems. Lots of tough challenges. So this is why Databricks suggested a lakehouse architecture like in 2020. It's a simple unified approach to data lakes and data warehouses. It's actually merging the best of data lakes and data warehouses. So 
you get the quality of service, the SQL and schemas and the speed of a data warehouse with the economics and the scale of a data lake. So SQL schema, speed of a data warehouse, economics and scale of a data lake. It's a lake first approach. Your data stays in the data lake. And just on top of your data lake, there is a thin open source layer. It's called Delta Lake. Delta.io is the project that gives you transactions as you know them from your database on your data lake. So you get versioning, you get deep and shallow clones, you get time travel, and you can roll back uh, failed inserts automatically. On top of Delta IO, there's a unified governance layer, which is working for SQL and there's three buckets and ML models. And on top of that, we have the classic workloads um, for, um, for workflows, orchestration, for machine learning, for ETL, for data warehousing. And today, like three quarters of all CIOs report that they have a lake house in their estate. And also Amazon, Azure, GCP, and Oracle, all the big data platform vendors, they talk about the lake house approach. They're ready to sell you their version of the lake house. So the lake house itself is more an architectural pattern um, than a product. Maybe that's a, a good takeaway from here. Right. So the lake house has already become a force in the market. But there's been this utter rapidly uh, rising, uh, rising technology called generative AI. And you might be familiar that Databricks um, acquired Mosaic ML. And um, we did this to even serve you better in this market. And uh, uh, the new vision is this data intelligence platform. So we brought together those two technologies closer to create a new category of the data platform. And with this data platform, we want to achieve two things. One is better use AI to support the role of a data engineer. This is what I'm talking about mostly in, in, in this talk. And then also provide you the best possible platform for training and customizing your own ML models. So it's actually AI infused on every layer with a data intelligence engine at the core. So you see Delta is still the foundation, Unity Catalog, the governance layer plays a central role and the unified approach is uh, paying off here really. So it's not 220 lobotomized cloud services that you might get from a cloud provider that only know about each other via IAM roles. It's one unified platform with the data intelligence engine at its core, at its heart. It's also about building and serving models. It's not what I'm diving deep here. I'm going to talk to you later about various possibilities from prompt engineering to, um, to pre-training data. We covered this in the hands-on section. And now I want to switch gears. Let me give you a hands-on walkthrough of our use case. One moment. It's about Chain's record shop. Chain is getting daily deliveries of secondhand vinyl records. And she started her business in LA, but now she's also having a subsidiary in Berlin. And therefore she wants to have one online shop and the shop should be based on one central catalog. And Chain wants to give her customers um, additional information. So she's spending a lot of time right now to get these artist descriptions so for you too, for example, she's Googling that, you know, it's an Irish rock band started in 1970 something and the lead singer is Bono, etc. cetera. And, and as you can imagine, this just costs a lot of time. So that's something she wants to automate and ask us for help. So this is our use case that we will cover. And lastly, I like to explain how to improve your developer efficiency with our notebooks and a new AI assistant which is actually built on the same LLM technology. So the whole module is all about hands-on data engineering and AI. Before I tell you more about the solution that we have built for Chain to support her vinyl record shop, I want to attach the usual disclaimer that a lot of those capabilities that I'm showing you here are still in preview. 
So it might take a little bit until they show you up in your own personal Databricks workspace. So Chain has to deal with a lot of small tasks and they all have to be executed reliably and in the right order. And this is why we're using Databricks workflows for that. Workflows is really easy to use and you can use it to orchestrate everything within the lake house. And actually we're working on workflows to be able to even execute tasks outside of the lake house right now. So there's many different task types and you can take one or many of these tasks and put them in a job. And then you define the control flow, like how these tasks should be executed. And it could be just a simple, well, sequential line, or it could be in parallel, or there could be a condition. You're gonna also see in the example, like job as a task. So all of these four different control flow styles we're gonna see in the example. Last but not least, once we have defined everything, we need to decide how we want to trigger a workflow. That means when such a job is run. It could be the classic, you know, just run it on Friday afternoon after three o'clock thing. It could be like, um, you know, I want to trigger it with, with an external API. Um, we're currently working on file arrival triggers there in preview right now. And we're working on um, table triggers. That means you can even trigger a workflow based on the update of a Delta Lake table. Or it could be continuous. Like right now, Jane wants to trigger her workflow once a day because that's enough. But she's thinking about expanding her business and then she wants to react immediately on incoming um, inventory. And this is where we would use workflows to run the ingestion pipeline in a continuous way. So let me change to the Databricks workspace. And if you go to the workspace and you click on the workflows, you see the existing workflows. And one of these workflows, like the Vinyl Dreams one, is the one that we built for Chain to support your business. So if I click on the workflows and tasks, you will see all the different tasks that the workflow consists of. And let me make this a tiny bit bigger for you to see. Um, so if you click on the first one, that's the ingestion part. Remember the CSV file that Jane had to ingest every single day. Um, that's done with a DLT pipeline, which is the perfect tool for data ingestion. Um, it also tells you here it's a Delta Life table pipeline. And then the second one, like this decision, this if then else decision goes back to Jane's business. You know, she's having one shop in LA and the other one in Berlin. In the early days, you couldn't use AI in, in Europe. This is why we had this switch if AI is enabled um, or not. So if it was enabled, like it's now enabled everywhere, we can use the LLMs to augment the catalog to uh, retrieve the, the description for the artists, which is actually happening in this step. And this step itself, if I click on this, you see it's a run job task type. Um, so it's it's actually forwarding to another job, to another workflow, which is like a sub module. So that's fantastic because this is um, a way to define boundaries within workflows. This is a way to define modules and to have these modules reusable. Just think about chain is reusing this core logic for you know adding description um, columns to her catalog um, with another tree uh, branch of her business. Right, so if this is uh, was not enabled, like in the previous days, so if this um, uh, is false, we just would send um, an email. And that's the core um, flow that Jane is using. Now, if I go back to here, you also see um, the whole um, notebooks that the workflow is based on, they could be pulled from a Git repository. That's the setting here. And remember the triggers that we had, like when do you want to kick off a workflow? It's defined here under schedules and triggers. So I could go to edit trigger and you see this workflow is running every one hour at 17 past the hour. And the idea here is, you know, if you if you start this UI, it just picks up the current um, time in, in, in minutes. So if it's like uh, 59 now, it would just say 59 past the hour. And the idea is to kind of spread the load uh, more equally, um, especially that's important if you're having, if you're still having a, a classic cluster and not going for serverless yet. But you can change it here to what any, whatever value you like to have. 
remember the chop parameter that I was using in this if then uh, uh, if then task. It's defined here, and then I can have run settings. I can define um, a queue length and concurrent users, and I can have the compute. That's the most important one. So I wanted to emphasize that um, we're starting to have the preview of serverless compute. And if you think about serverless compute, how it started with these, you know, web-based functions and the definition was they scale quickly, they scale to zero, you only pay for value, you intrinsically get high availability and security. Now with workflows, there is much more happening. So I can't show you this yet because it's not in the UI, but the goal is within workflows, you should be able to switch it to serverless. That means you don't have to specify a cluster anymore. You don't see it, you don't admin it, you don't debug it, you don't configure it. It's just running in a serverless way. But uh, on a user level, you have the possibility to say, I want to run this job as quickly as possible, or I want to run this job as cheaply as possible. So that's the setting here um, for compute. Then looking at the ingestion task again, or the ingestion pipeline, that's the big picture. So typically we have a brass table, which is a streaming table. The streaming table is append only, it's incremental, it remembers its state, it remembers what records were ingested already. That means if you ingest like a billion records and then there are 17 new uh, records showing up, it will only ingest the 17 new records. This is also like why streaming can be very efficient and can be very cheap because you avoid uh, duplicate uh, ingest uh, of, of existing records and you don't have to manage the state yourself. That's all done um, by Delta Life tables. And then typically we go from bronze to silver and gold and we create either another streaming table or materialized view. Now the materialized view is used for more complex joins, joins of different tables. It could be a view uh, based on a join of different tables. It could be a more complex aggregation and very often they're used um, for BI dashboards or for other um, resources um, downstream. Now the streaming table here is typically fed from either Cloud Files, which is autoloader. It's a streaming data source that is uh, picking up all the files, all the um, CSV, Parquet, JSON, whatever files you put in a directory or you put in an S3 bucket, or it could read from Kafka or Kinesis. Now these systems, they typically have a short retention period. So you want to get the data out of these systems as quickly as possible. And you want to have it persistent in this bronze silver um, gold environment. Now, looking at the code, looking at the UI, it looks like this. This is my um, vinyl DLT pipeline. You see that's the ingest table. It's a streaming table. The inventory table is fed by this streaming table. It's a materialized view. So it's a very small pipeline, but it does its job. And um, I'll tell you a secret. Actually, before I had this pipeline, I had a notebook. I was using Spark Structured Streaming, Python programming, more complicated, more challenging. And then I turned it into this pipeline and it just became much easier and much, much better to, um, to maintain. So that's the graphical view. If I click on settings, you can see it's actually switched to serverless already. If I disable serverless, all the compute here shows up. If I enable serverless, all the compute is gone. So DLT always used its own cluster. It's actually using its own DBR version. And we have a, a intelligent way of, uh, of using the latest version. If something goes wrong, we can also roll it back, etc. But with serverless, even this, you know, this cluster that is generated behind the curtains for DLT is gone. So it's all completely serverless. The other thing I want to point out is here I could turn the pipeline to continuous mode. So if we expect a lot more business for Jane and she wants to pick up new deliveries almost instantly, we would run the pipeline in continuous mode. Here, as I told you, we can save a lot of money. We can keep the same streaming programming model and then trigger the pipeline uh, every hour, which is workflows, uh, which workflow is doing for us. Then the pipeline is uh, 
is using tables, which are persisted tables and views, I should say, which are persisted in Unity Catalog. Unity Catalog is the governance um, tool that we have across the lake house. It allows us um, access privileges um, on the one hand side, but also lineage on the other hand side, end to end. And that's something I want to show you um, in just a second. Unity Catalog, that's the catalog and that's the schema. And with this, I want to go back to the code. Actually, if you have the pipeline and you click on source code, you get to the source code. It's uh, the SQL source code that I already mentioned. This is the definition of the streaming table. It's actually always this CTAS statements, create table as select from something. And the, the something here is cloud files, which is autoloader. The interesting thing here to point out is autoloader is reading from a volume. Now volume is like a directory, but it's a managed entity in Unity Catalog again. So I can show you this volume later in Unity Catalog. It's reading all the CSV files. It's putting them into a streaming table. And we also have a constraint here. So I want to make sure I'm only picking up vinyl discs. That's something like, you know, it's a business level thing that I only want to work with vinyl discs. It's something that Chain has with her, um, with the guy that delivers the vinyl discs. Um, there should no, no, there shouldn't be any any CD. If this goes wrong, it will show up in the pipeline view. It will show up right here. So if the ingestion here, you see it's 25 discs um, ingested, and it's two that went wrong. Two records were dropped. If I click on data quality here, you see it's the vinyl check drop 7.4 percent. Two of them dropped because they were CDs, not vinyl, uh, not vinyl discs. Um, yeah, that's it. Streaming table ingestion exactly as we've shown on the slide. Um, then materialized view to further process the data. Here, I really wouldn't need a materialized view. I just did it to, you know, for a proof of concept. Um, we ingest from uh, the ingestion table. We narrow it down because, you know, all the good music was done before 2000. Um, sometimes we have this discussion, should it be a constraint or should it be a where clause? I would say it depends on what you're trying to achieve. This is more business logic and this is more the exception that you want to display graphically. Put uh, no, Select the one that, uh, that makes uh, most sense um, to you. All right, so you understand streaming table, you understand materialized views, you see we ingest um, from this um, volume. And um, now what I want to show you, if you click on the streaming table, um, here you also see the target table. It goes to this catalog schema table. If I click on the table, um, it directly takes me to the catalog, which is listing a lot of things. And I want to narrow it down to my data and I summit um, table. It's actually three tables. It goes from in chest to inventory. And later I use this records table. Remember the volume? It's also shown here because it's a UC managed entity. Um, that's cool. Um, that's the file in the volume. It goes to this volume and it's actually backed up by an S3 bucket, but it's all done automatically for me because I just clicked on create managed volume. Now, if you click on ingest and then if I go to lineage here um, and I refresh the lineage, the data lineage uh, is looking like this told you we ingest from the volume. It's shown here. It goes to a streaming table. It goes to materialized view. And then if there is more um, downstream tables, I would also see them here, um, like this records table that I am using after the inventory table. It goes from volume, streaming table, materialized view to this downstream records table. And that's the end-to-end -end lineage view. And that's actually something really amazing and, and unique for the Databricks Lake House, because imagine it goes on here. It would be a feature table for machine learning model. So you have the whole end-to-end -end view from ingesting files from a volume through the pipeline to the machine learning model. And that's amazing. <laughs> that's great. So actually the last thing here uh, related to ETL pipelines and DLT that I want to point out is the new developer experience. Within the notebook where you define the SQL, 
um, we can now actually validate the pipeline. So if I go to a uh, pipeline and I click on validate, it it will spin up uh, uh, it will spin up the validation of the pipeline. That should happen really quickly. And did you see it just took like I don't know like a second or two seconds, and we see the pipeline is correct and we see the graphical view. Um, we also get um, the log files. Actually, all these log files, all these log entries, um, they are persisted in system tables. They're normal data tables. You can access them from any um, SQL browser, etc. All right, now let's go back to the workflow. Now, going back to the workflows, and if I click on the workflow that I'm interested in, first of all, you see the matrix view where you see the total execution times of the of the workflow runs and you see the individual tasks and here this task didn't exist yet and the red ones they show that there was a problem and then I, I could just fix the problem fix the notebook and click on repair and rerun and it would run all the uh, it would run the node with the problem in all the depending nodes and remember this was the um, the task view and that was the pipeline that we just um, explained very thoroughly and the interesting one is, is this one here, and this is where we branch to another workflow. So we run another job, and it's actually this job. That's the, the matrix view. And then if I click on tasks, um, you will see that this job is doing a number of steps. And let me, is doing a number of steps. So it, it preps the data, and then it applies the LLM logic. And this is what we want to understand. So if I click on this task, um, you will see it's running a SQL query and the query actually looks like this, which um, takes me to the SQL editor and which shows you how exactly I can call out to an LLM. Now, the core function is called AI generate text function and it's, it's well documented. So basically from within SQL, you can call this function Okay, so that's the query that is executed. And the, the query is actually a function with a name artist description. The artist description is called with the name of the artist that could be you too. And then the return, which is the description of the artist is then um, written to the records table into the description column. But what happens in this function is the following. It's actually using this AI um, generate um, text function. And um, it's right here. You see it's calling AI generate text. That's the SQL way of calling out to a LLM. It will then go to Azure OpenAI. Um, there is a prompt engineer that says, well, give me the mutist, uh, music artist in two sentences for you two. It's using a secret token that is stored um, as a Databricks token. And that's all just um, syntactic sugar. And with the return, we can update our table. And then if I go to the SQL dashboards, I have a dashboard and the dashboard. Let's look at this. It's run in real time right now. It's actually, we have uh, new charts. I turn this off. It's actually run against the serverless um, data warehouse again. And you see we have those artists and this is nothing new, but if I scroll to the right hand side, um, let's go and see, this is U2. So U2 is an Irish rock band formed in 1976, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the LLM um, augmented data for my catalog. So a one minute overview of what we just did. Um, basically, if you look at LLMs, you could train your own LLM model from scratch. This is like the where you need the most data that costs you the most time. You need the most money because you have to pay off for these. You have to pay for all these expensive uh, GPUs. Then you could go like one step to the left and just fine tune an existing model. But again, you need a lot of data. You need uh, quite a few um, CPUs. So it still costs you a lot of money. And the question is like, um, is it really worth doing that? So uh, another approach is, you know, you have a prompt, you take the prompt, you call out to a vector database, you enrich the prompt, uh, you feed the vector database yourself with your own domain knowledge. And you have this um, augmented generation, which is another solution. Now, what I showed you was the, the easiest one you can imagine. And it's just, you know, prompt engineering, 
uh, we have a simple prompt like give me the description of this artist in two sentences we call out to an existing already trained llm and that's a perfect use case um, for all the data engineers and it it works really well for you know generating descriptions it actually works really well for classifying texts. Um, you could have reviews from an internal conference and then say, hey, this written review just rated on a scale from, I don't know, zero to 10 and, and give me like, how, how much did the, the person who reviewed, uh, who reviewed the conference um, like it? Um, so there's many, many use cases where these LLMs um, work um, perfectly well. It's also to shorten and summarize um, texts, um, et cetera. All right, so um, this is using external LLM models, but now um, the lake house is having more and more built-in AI as well. And this starts actually in a very internal level, like um, how we do partitioning, um, how we do predictive IO, that's other topics that uh, other people have talked about before. What I want to show you is two things. Um, first of all, I want to go back to the catalog and um, in the catalog, if we go to dice, we have our tables like on the vinyl. And then for example, I have this records table and then I could have a AI generated comment, which is a preview. I can edit this comment. I'm actually not claiming that this comment where it describes the record table here is always perfect, but who likes you know who likes documentation raise your hand if you like documentation um if not just take this as a first version and then you know edit edit this and and add your own um comment and then save this improve it and you know you have a documentation which is better than having no documentation so that's that's one side of where we use um ai assistance the other one is if we go back to to the notebooks so in any notebook, if you click here, you get to the AI assistant. And then if you click on a notebook cell, you can say, well, explain me this code. Um, and then the system is also talking to an LLM. It's not sending any personal data, but it gives you a pretty good explanation. So it tells you it's, it's Spark SQL. Um, it uses expectations, uses a data, it does data quality with a constraint. Etc. It's reading from this volume, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is uh, working really, really well. If you do something wrong and you have, um, you know, like a, a wrong table name, um, something I could say, you know, this is the not year, but something like this. I could also say, hey, come on, help me to fix my code, and then it would come up and give you suggestions about fixing your code. So we, we talked about the core data engineering tasks and how a data engineer can benefit from using LLM technology. And I want to say thank you. You've been a great audience. Um, please talk to me at any of our summits or connect on LinkedIn. Bye. Thank you.